So today we're getting out of the studio and I'm doing what I love the most, working with a client one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to see Scott, who's a guy I've worked with for many years. He weighs almost 500 pounds and permanent weight loss has always eluded him. He improves for a while, but then he's pulled back into his food addiction. His doctors warn him that his life is on the line. His heart's eventually gonna give out. My goal today is to get him to talk about the root cause of his problem. I'm Tara Marie, and I'm a fitness expert, personal trainer, and motivational strategist. Optimal health is achieved when you're balanced mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, and spiritually. My goal is to bring you information that will help you be the best version of you. Good. It's been so long. I know, I know. How are you doing out here in Queens? I'm doing great. I'm yeah? Doing great. Look at my beautiful little Oh apartment. my God, I do love this. Yeah, check out the view. This is beautiful. Oh, this is check nice. Check out uh, to your left. You see the Freedom Tower? Is that unbelievable? This is beautiful. Thank you. This is a better view than you had in Manhattan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sunsets are unbelievable. This is amazing. Do you miss us? Like, do you miss the city? Or? I miss it a little. I love this. This is a very nice place. Thank I'm you. loving Thank your you. space. How have you been, sweetheart? Uh, hanging in there, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, I was, well, I, on the way over here, I was trying to say to myself, like, how long has it been since we've even seen each other? It's been about, uh, I think, a good three and a half years. So what is your age now? I'm 61. What's your current weight? I'm currently at uh, 485 pounds. 485, okay. So I've stayed, you know, within that range really, my gosh, for mm -hmm. about 12, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Where I've been in the 450 to 500 range. And every time I lose the weight, I, I just look at myself and say, it's not enough and it's going to be too difficult. So I just give up and say the hell with it and go back to binging and and eating like I used to. And I want to get over that. And I think we, we have to do that because it's time, because you know that as you've gotten older, you're crumbling under your weight. Have you noticed that it's gotten harder and harder as you've aged to manage the weight? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm moving less. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's difficult to walk. Since I saw you, I'm, I'm walking with a cane. I need a cane. Yeah. You know, outside of my apartment, I need a cane to walk. You know, just, my mobility has, you know, has, has really gone down less and less. I mean, I remember when we used to meet, you know, He's three, four years ago yeah. and walking along, you know, uh, Riverside uh, Park, Park yeah. and, and I miss that, but I, I can't do it now. Do you have chronic pain? It's, uh, yes, I like to get up right now from this chair, mm -hmm. my, my knees will hurt and, and the muscles you know, on the back side of my legs. So it's so difficult to stand up. And then once I stand up, it takes me a minute to, or two to actually start walking. And the longer I sit, the, the worse it is when I stand up, the worse the pain is. I see that you are on some medications. Have things changed since we worked together? They, they have. Well, total, I'm taking six medications. Okay. And I do that religiously every morning. Uh, for my AFib, I'm uh, taking Xeralto. Uh, still on the high blood pressure medicine, like I was before. And uh, two other heart pills, metoprolol and uh, amlodine. Uh, aside from the atrial fibrillation, what has the doctor said? Is it your, because obviously your heart muscle is gonna get strained from being obese. The, the big thing that my heart doctor and really all doctors I see have said is, Scott, you need to lose the weight. You need to have the surgery. And I absolutely, will not do the surgery. And you mean bariatric surgery? Correct, uh, or the, specifically uh, the, I think what they call the sleeve Gastric surgery. Gastric sleeve, Right, yeah. I won't go with the, the full surgery. But mm -hmm. but anyway, that, that's out of the question. Where I really need help and where I need your help, Tara, when I do lose, even if it's 20 or 30 pounds, I need to learn to appreciate it and that it'll get better, that it's not only gonna get better as far as uh, changing physically, but but mainly, you know, it'll it'll get better where I'll, I'll have less pain. When we work together in two months, you'll lose 75 pounds. And my attitude is, wow, in four months, that could be 150 pounds. 
but your attitude is, I'm gonna quit. What leads to that kind of frustration that leads you to quit rather than say, 175 could be 150 if I just wait another two months? Okay, what the, the frustration is, I, I don't see the change as much. You know, I feel like it should be a greater physical change, you know, when I lose that 50 pounds or 75 pounds. Mm -hmm. But also what comes back in my mind, what conjures up is, is the things that, that I can't accept about myself that keeps me hiding behind food, that keeps me, you know, I, I realize, I mean, I'm smart enough to, to realize that I'm trying to hide myself by binging and being compulsive overeater. I still haven't gotten over, you know, why I'm just so obsessed and compulsive with food. Yeah. Uh, I've, and I have every reason to lose the weight. I have every reason to, you know, watch what I eat. Yeah. And it's, it's just unbelievable how I would, you know, rather live in pain just to have, you know, my food. Your food addiction is just a form of abuse. All addicts, I've worked with drug addicts, chain smokers, alcoholics, food addicts, they all have three things in common. Number one, they use their substance to numb feelings. Yes. Would you agree that you oh, use yeah, food to numb feelings? Feelings come up, you don't wanna feel them, you don't wanna deal with them, which means you're not gonna heal them. So you numb them, which just keeps them stuffed in your body. Number two, all addicts have something about their life or about themselves, who they are, that they want to escape. And all addicts I've ever worked with, none of them like themselves. I want to explore this with you because I believe that if you're really willing to get really just dirty, gritty, honest with yourself, that's the key to your healing. Because essentially there's a hole inside of you that you're trying to fill with food and it's not working because if food would fix it, it would have fixed it by now, right? Absolutely, right. yeah. So, so let's talk about this. You're using, your substance of choice is food. And I get right. that, you're not alone. What feelings are you trying to numb? Are you aware of the feelings that are coming up? Yes, I mean, it's the feelings of, of not feeling, of not, of not being good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I'm a, a good person. I know I'm a good person in, in general. You know, I'm very, uh, you know, compassionate and, uh, but I don't feel like I'm good enough. I have this terrible attitude that everything is bullshit in life. And it's a terrible attitude to have. I'm definitely, you know, more pessimistic than optimistic. And and the thing is, uh, you know, it just it just that just bothers me. It bothers me that I feel like I have no talent, no expertise in any one thing, and that just bothers the heck out of me. And when did you first? Because what I'm hearing underneath what you're saying is I'm hearing you say that you feel unworthy, almost like you're unworthy of having a beautiful life that other people have. When did you first in your life feel unworthy? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's a strong word to say un unworthy, but uh, I, I guess you're right. It's, uh, you know, not to feel good enough, uh, I mean, I, I even felt it in, at a very young age, you know, when I was in, uh, you know, maybe even as young as grade school, but definitely middle school, uh, where, uh, you know, I wasn't, again, I wasn't athletic. I wasn't, uh, see, I had friends that uh, were like great at uh, playing guitar mm -hmm. or, or magicians, uh, or, or they were great, you know, in sports. And I fe felt like I never had a talent. You know, uh, you know, couldn't play an instrument, uh, wasn't good. With... Did you ever try? Did you ever try anything? No, I, I, I never tried. And, and yet, like, you know, throughout my whole adult life, people, you know, enjoy being in my company. Mm -hmm. And I realized that because they, en you know, enjoy to hear, you know, the knowledge that I have about pop culture or whatever the subject matter might be. And, mm -hmm. 
I'm getting, yeah, starting to get, you know, emotional about it. But, uh, and I know it's, it's like ridiculous, you know, like someone says, well, if you want to be, you know, an expert at something, so read up on it or take courses. I have friends and family that say, Scott, get over it. You are very talented. Yeah. And, and I know I need to accept it. Yeah. Uh, because what's happened is that feeling of I'm not good enough, why even try, has turned into just kind of sitting on the sidelines of life. You're not out participating in life. You're watching it out of a window. That's why you like the big views, right? Because you like <laughs> to sit true. and watch life. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that you say that. It's true. You, yeah. you know me well. Uh, Right. You, you like to watch the rest of us live our lives, but you don't even want to get out there and try because you feel like whatever you try, it's just not going to be good enough. And yeah, so you keep true. yourself, what you've done is, my hunch is that you've buried yourself under 250 extra pounds of weight so you can keep the bar real low. Because when you weigh close to 500 pounds, people don't have expectations of you. If they have no expectations, you'll never disappoint them. You're right. <laughs> yeah, that makes See? a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, so the feelings that you're numbing are unworthiness, the pain of feeling unworthy, the pain of loneliness. I don't know. I, unworthy to me is not the right, I don't feel this is the right word. It's, it's uh, you know, to have, la not to feel like I have enough knowledge in something. I, I don't equate that with being unworthy. I but mean, you don't. I know, do you feel as good as the rest of the people? No. Okay, I so don't. that you're not worthy. You're not, you're not as good as the I, rest. I feel. I feel less than. Yeah. Yeah. You're I, less I just don't than. like the word the word worthy, but I, you know, I definitely feel less than the person I'm speaking yeah, with. You feel less than the other. You feel right. like you're not good enough. Not good enough. You right. feel lonely as hell. What about disappointment? How disappointed are you? Well, I'm disappointed in myself that. I'm not as good as I can be. I'm not as knowledgeable as I could be in the subject matter at hand. So I avoid, you know, talking to someone. Yet I've been told so many times, you know, others around me do not perceive me like I perceive myself. But you know what, Scott? You keep saying that the big problem in your life is that you don't know subject matter. I think it's much deeper than that. I think you don't like who you are, not the subject matter and what you know. I think it's who you are, and an easy way of deflecting it is to make it about subject matter. Okay, but, but who I am, Tara, okay, I mean, who I am, you know, by, by others saying to me, Scott, you're capable of doing this. You're a smart guy. You know, you're very intelligent, whatever the subject matter we're talking about. I, I feel like I'm a phony. I mean, that, that's how best I could explain it. I don't feel like, right, I, I don't feel good enough. I, I feel like a phony, so I'd rather av avoid that conversation. Tell me about your father. How was your relationship with your father when you were a little boy? Was he accepting oh, of you? Yeah, my relationship, you know, with my father and my mother, you know, were, were very good. And, uh, and, and also, you know, with my friends. Uh, you know, uh, I had a lot of friends. Again, you know, people like to be in my company, and I don't know why. I don't know why I just can't accept that, that that's good enough. Because I feel like, you know, a talent is not being able to, you know, speak in public or have knowledge about the different subjects I have. To me, a talent is, again, like playing a, a musical instrument or, or being good at uh, you know magic tricks, or but see, I think or a good my, athlete, it's my instinct is telling me that this goes past because if, if that's if that's your definition of a talent, then I don't have a talent either. So to make you, I don't yeah. I don't do anything I don't do anything like that. But my gut feeling is telling me that at some point when you were young, somebody made you feel unworthy, like you didn't deserve to take up your space. Well, I, you know, okay, you're asking me about my father. I mean, my father did expect more from me. I mean, I was the first one to uh, go to college in my family. Mm -hmm. So a lot was expected of me. You know, I was supposed to be an accountant. I mean, I went to school, a business school that was known for accounting, mm -hmm. but that wasn't for me. And I would, uh, my father would say to me, you know, why can't, 
you'd be like your your cousin Steve, who is uh, very successful in business. He would. So I have to admit that, you know, that did affect me a lot. At some point in your life, you were made to feel like you weren't good enough. Forget the word unworthy if that word is kind of, you know, you just kind of weren't good enough. And you internalize that. And sometimes what we do is when we're young and when we're impressionable, we take things in. And then when that person stops saying it, we keep repeating it to ourselves. So maybe your father implanted a seed in you that, Scott, you're just not good enough. You're not measuring up. And you took that seed and you it implanted in your brain. And that's why, for, I don't think this has anything to do with a talent or a this or a that, because I said, well, have you ever tried? And you said, no. I think you're thinking, why even bother? I'm not good enough. Nothing you ever do is going to be good enough. And that's why when we would lose weight and we would lose 75 pounds and I'd be excited because we're halfway to 100, 150 and then that's halfway to 300, you know what I mean? I would be excited for you. It just wasn't good enough because for your father, nothing was ever enough. So you've started well, kind of doing that to yourself. Yeah, no, I, th- that is a good point. And, and it bothers me that I haven't been able to overcome that, you know, as I got older. I mean, here I am at 61 and, uh, you know, I, I Your I dad's been, been dead that. 30 years. No, I, I, I know, I know. And it's still haunting you. I mean, it, it is. But you see, you said to, you said to me, I have to get myself to where I can appreciate what I do have. Right. The reason I believe you don't is because when you were little, you'd say, Daddy, Daddy, look, look. And he'd say, that's not good enough. So do you see you're hearing that in your head? Right. You've programmed your brain. Well, I'm, I'm hearing it's uh, because I didn't uh, become an accountant, mm-hmm. you know, I, or for that matter, because I didn't start a business like my, my cousin Steve, who sold it for millions of dollars that, you know, I'm not a success. It's like, why couldn't you do that? Right. And, you know, and if he, he was able to do it. he said that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he said it. You right. know, if he was able to do it, why can't you do it? Because I know I come across as being capable. I know I come across as being smart. And, you know, I have, you know, good intelligence and, and capability. But uh, I just have that lack of confidence. And you've got to you've got to reprogram your mind because again, your father, God rest his soul, has been gone for thirty years, and he's controlling your life like you're a puppet. Because any effort you make, you just you tell yourself it's not good enough. You're never going to be enough, and you've got to break that because what you're doing to yourself is you're abusing yourself because you believe that crap. Do you understand? But I don't want to. You know, I, I don't know if it's all. I, I agree with you and I understand that some of the reason why I behave the way I'm behaving is because more was expected of me. And especially when it comes from a parent like my father, it does mean a lot. And as we're talking here, I'm getting a little upset because to hear you say, uh, you know, he's been gone for 30 years, you're still like on like a puppet on strings and he's still controlling your life. I don't believe that. I believe he wanted to see me be successful and he knew I was capable of it. I, I, you know, I, I, it's just bothering me, you know, how you're uh, interpreting that, you know, the, the, uh, you know, my, my father's influence on me because I don't want to, you know, he was a great man. I don't want to. I'm sure he was a great man. I'm just saying that his words are ringing in your brain to this day. And they are, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, they shouldn't be. Yeah. You know, I could accept that fact, but I don't want to put, you know, the blame is not on him. I'm 61 years no, old now. The blame, I should have been able mm-hmm, to get over yeah. that. The blame, my attitude you know? is this. When you're a kid, you have to look to the parents. But once you're out of the house and you're an adult, your life is your responsibility. Right. And you've got to put the pieces together. So here's the thing. With feelings... When you numb them, they don't express. They don't, they don't, you just numb them 
and then you're just you just numb them long enough until you take the next hit of your substance any kind of drug opiates alcohol food, food whatever yeah you just numb them it's not an effective means of dealing the way to get past this is to feel your feelings you have to feel them you have to deal with them and then you can heal them confronting your feelings in your case will mean confronting your fears because I believe all of your negative feelings about yourself are fear-based, not being good enough. I bring right. nothing to the table. Exactly. I don't even deserve to be in this space. Do you, under, do you understand? Yeah, exactly. So it, it just means confronting your fears. Okay, I'll agree with you. With, with all the mistakes I might make in business or in the mistakes I might have in a conversation with someone about pop culture because I didn't remember something or about you know, baseball because, you know, I forgot a name or this or that. I can't internalize it that that I'm a failure because I don't have enough expertise in any of these things or I'm scared to go out and talk to people about anything because I don't want to be looked at that that I'm a phony. When did failing become a bad thing? You have to fail in order to succeed. And when you do fail, it doesn't make you a failure. You failed. But my, my failure is even in having any kind of conversation with anyone. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel natural. See, that's another thing. I, I don't feel like I'm a natural. I wish I was a natural. A natural on having a conversation about whatever it might be. I'm worried about saying the wrong thing. Not, not knowing something. Let's play out your fear. Okay, so you go out on the social scene and you, you make a blunder. You say something that's ridiculous. So now what's gonna happen? That person's gonna walk away and say, gee, I just spoke to that fat schmuck. See, I beat myself up. I say these horrible See, things. See, that's the problem. That's where this, the has, this has nothing you know, to do. This has, that, that fat but schmuck. can I tell you something? We just got a, a breakthrough. This has nothing to do with about knowledge or talent. This is because you believe you're a fat schmuck. Well, that's going a little strong. You just said, you just said, look at that yeah. fat schmuck. Well, uh, <laughs> um, those were your words. I yeah, didn't yeah, use, I yeah. don't use those words. No, no, I'm not a, you know, I have some, you know, faith in myself or, or, or some self-esteem. Okay, that, so play it out. So I walk away yeah. and I go, look at that fat schmuck. Then what happens? Well, it, it bothers me that you would have a negative uh, thought about Why? me. Why? Why would you care what I think? Maybe I'm a too sensitive of a guy. But the irony is, you know, most people care about what they do. You know, they have a talent. They're good at putting, you know, they might be a smart lawyer, accountant, or they're a great interior designer. Or, or the, the thing is, with a lot of heavy people, it's not because they're lazy. And unfortunately, I'm holding up the banner that fat people are lazy. Well, I'm one of those. I'm lazy, I take the easy way out, you know, and I feel like I've done that, you know, my, my whole life. Your opinion of yourself is rather low. You right. want, you're trying to escape those feelings and you're essentially, you're trying to escape who you are. I what wanna be you're... strong enough that I'm not bothered by someone who, who might be critical of me. Yeah, I'm not. Because yeah. the majority of people are supporting me. Mm -hmm. Majority of people like me. Yeah. I, can't, I, I know I have to get over it, but how do I, how do I get over it? How do I accept it? You just decide, you know what? This is what I think about myself. And right. what you think about me is none of my business. Right. And if you want to be it. critical of me, I, I just have to learn how to accept it, that Here, it's here's, okay. Here's also the truth. This is what I've also learned about people. Most people are so self-involved. Nobody's looking at me, worrying about what I do, what I say, what I wear, because they're worrying about themselves. And it's so funny what you say, because I'm so alone and I don't socialize at all, yeah. that when I'm in a car, I feel like everyone's looking at me. Nobody. You know, like you're looking at someone picking yeah. their nose. Everyone's looking at me and they're going, look at that fat person in the car. He's like slouched but down. That's and because that's and, your opinion of yourself. Right. Right. See, we, we and no one else cares, like you said. No one gives a damn. But to my damn. mind, it, it's just like you know, why isn't my best friend calling me? He's so involved. You know, they started a second family because right. he didn't want to be home alone after the older kids left. He's so involved in everything, and I feel like if I don't hear from him in in a couple of weeks, like what did I do wrong or whatever? Yeah. Meanwhile, he calls me up. I'm going to be out here. We're going to be in Saratoga Springs. Come, 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 see us, and. It doesn't matter that I'm walking with a cane yeah. and I can barely keep up with them. They, you know, they love me. Pe yeah. People love me. Yeah, you've just got to love yourself. See, I, I hate... 
Scott, you've just got to love yourself. You've just got to decide. You have to make the decision that you're here, you're okay, just the way you are. And if right. nothing changes, things can improve. Things can always improve. But if nothing right. does, you're fine just the way you are. And when you take that approach and you love yourself, because see, we abuse the things we don't value and the things we don't love. We take care of the things we do value and the things we love. The reason you abuse your body is because you don't give a crap about it. And what's bothering me now is this is not the first time I've had this realization. Yeah. And yet I still go back into my addiction with, with food. You're hiding behind your addiction. Still... See, addicts hide behind their addiction because it's safe behind the addiction. It's something you know. You may be miserable. You may be riddled with pain. You may walk with a cane. You, it may be hard right. for you to shower and take care of yourself, but at least it's familiar. What's right. on the other side of that door out there is unfamiliar and that makes it scary. What no. you have to do is make some decisions about your life and make some decisions about yourself. And it's gonna feel very artificial at first because you're gonna be thinking things and saying things about yourself and being like, I don't even believe that. So you've got to keep putting those thoughts implanted in your mind and you've got to take measured risks. I want to look at your kitchen because okay. I want to look at your environment here in the home where you spend a lot of time. Okay. It needs to be a safety zone. Well, I can tell you right now, there's a lot of bad things okay. in there. And, and you're right. I could avoid it by not bringing it in the house right. I'm gonna and go taking take a, look. a deep breath when I'm driving, not to stop at a... Let me take a look. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Okay, Scott, so let's see what's in this kitchen. All right, so far, I don't think things look so bad because I don't see, except for one, this one corner over here, I don't see a lot of bad stuff. Um, can I open the fridge? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let me see. This is not so bad. This is not so bad. So he's got some Greek yogurt, some fruit, whole fruit, organic carrots, grapes, fruit. Okay, fridge is not so bad. Fridge is not so bad. I got to tell you, you've got, basically you've got some fruit, some vegetables, some Greek yogurt, some organic honest tea. The fridge isn't so bad. And I have the hummus and the, the guacamole, the avocado. Yeah. I think I'm not going to like what I see in the freezer though. Uh, probably not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I was accurate. Okay. So you've got a lot of, you've got chunky monkey, you've got waffles, other blueberry waffles, more chunky monkey, popsicles. Um, yes. You, you like sugar. Seems like you like sugar. Lots of waffles, lots of processed food. Okay. Let's come over here. The honest tea, I don't mind this because this, it, it's just, it's, it's Yeah, it's all unsweetened. unsweetened. Yeah, I never had problems really with sweetened drinks. That's not my problem. Yeah. It's, it's uh, too much food and processed food. Okay. So things like chips. This yep. is what I'm talking about. When I'm saying I want you to eat real food, this is what I call a food like an edible food like product. What I want you to start thinking of is eating for nutrition, for nutrition for your cells. If it's not going to feed your cells, it's just a waste of calories. Okay. Marshmallows. I know it's all sugar. Uh, marshmallows. <laughs> and again, the sugar, remember we talked about the sugar creates the inflammation in the body, which then creates the pain, right? So we're going to get rid of the sugar. And we've got peanut butter. I have nothing against peanut butter. I eat peanut butter. I do prefer organic peanut butter that's just peanuts. You know, no, something well, with big, no the sugar. The big thing with me, Tara, is controlling also the, the volume. Right. It's like I know what you're saying about the clean food and the not processed. Not so bad. Not so bad. There's some junk food here for sure. There's a lot of good, but you've got a stash that you can use for a binge between the marshmallows and the ice cream and the popsicles and the waffles, which I'm sure you probably somewhere in here have syrup and you know things like that. So those are the kind of things that we want to think about. And if we clean up your diet by getting, you know, and I understand that, that eating that amounts and quality and quantity control is an issue for you. Again, we can probably get you off at least three of these prescription medications, which do no, nothing good for your liver. I honestly don't think that this is that bad. I, I mean, I thought it was gonna be worse than it is. I want you to consider committing to some things that we're gonna tweak in your life that I think will propel you in a new direction. Are you open to that? Yes, I am, yes. Okay, let me come around. I wanna to talk to you about this. Well, we've taken a look at your kitchen and I want you to commit to cleaning up your environment. And I think you understand why that needs to happen because Absolutely. I need this to be like a safety zone. 
And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a list of foods generalized that I want you to have in the house and everything else has to go. And you can already imagine what that's going to be. All the ice cream and cookies and candy, all that has got to go. Right. I want to give you some bullet points here that I'd love for you to commit to if you're willing. The first is I want you to consider having daily movement daily movement every day because I believe that your osteoarthritis is hurting you as much as it is because of lack of movement, not because of moving. Because osteoarthritis, when you move, it actually lubricates the joints. You actually start to feel better. So since I know this feels overwhelming, I want you to consider any amount of movement a win. So if you leave your house and go downstairs and check the mail, or if you walk around the block or you go downstairs and you walk around the shopping area, just any kind of movement. If you move around for 15 minutes and if then if you stretch that to 20 and you know, because you'll build up a kind of stamina and you'll start okay. to feel better. Can you commit to that? Yes. I also want you to think about having one small win every day. I think what you need to do to get over this feeling of overwhelm facing life. I think that you need to have one challenge every day, something that seems like it would provoke anxiety in you, going downstairs to grocery shop, going downstairs to check your mail. I want you to observe yourself mastering daily activities of life so you can feel like you can get back in the game a little bit. Well, I think the, the big thing is like when I go to work yeah. and I'm talking to a customer, it's knowing that I know what I'm, I'm speaking of, even if the customer mm -hmm. says something, uh, you know, negative to me. And uh, if I could accept that, whatever he has to say, that- Is just what he has to say. Right. Right, so give yourself the chance to put yourself out there and find yourself mastering life, being a part of life, getting out of this apartment and rejoining life. And again, if it feels too big, just do something a little smaller because it's gonna happen in baby steps. And first you go a little bit and then you go further and further and further and then you realize you've expanded your world. Okay? okay, that makes sense. Now the next one I wanna talk about your mindset because I think your mindset to a great extent is your biggest problem. It's what's creating all the anxiety and it's what's ultimately holding you back. So what we need to do is start to get you very aware of your automatic thoughts. And automatic thoughts are thoughts that happen in the background and we don't even have an awareness of them. It's just our, our subconscious mind is constantly talking to us. We're always talking to ourselves and our mind is always talking to us. So I want you to start getting a real keen awareness of what's happening in your mind. And when a thought comes up that's unpleasant or it's negative about you, you need to challenge it. You need to say to yourself, is that true? Even if it were true, so what? What's gonna happen? Do you uh, understand? Well, I need, yeah, I need to practice that. <laughs> because what's happening uh, is, yeah. I feel like you're catastrophizing small things. Things that could and should roll off your back, you're turning into a big story about who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, I, and none yes. of it even exists. Do you understand? Yeah, absolutely. I, I want you generally to have an awareness of what's happening in your mind, but your assignment will be that two times a day, I want you to catch yourself, hear the thought, and even say out loud, re-script it. You can re-script your thoughts. If I go up to those people, they're gonna think that I'm stupid and I'm a bumbling idiot. Re-script it. If I go up to those people, I have plenty to say. And then again, take it to the next step. If they think you're a bumbling idiot, who cares? What's gonna happen? Nothing detrimental okay. comes of it. I, I think I could do that. Now I want you to take the mindset into the binge eating because I think that there are times when you're more prone to binge eating than others. When you feel like you're walking into that kitchen to start a binge, or when you're picking up your phone to call to get takeout, you have an awareness <laughs> that you're about to do it. Okay, All as right. a binge eater, yeah. I know there's, there's that yeah. moment, you know it's about to happen. Stop, say to yourself, talk to yourself, Say, Scott, what are you feeling right now? It, it really f figure out what it is. Am I lonely? Do I just feel like a loser? Do I feel shame? Do I feel boredom? Figure out what the it is because those feelings need to be dealt with head on because if you feel it, then you need to deal with it in order to heal it. And if you don't deal with it, that means you're never gonna get past the step. You're always gonna be just squashing down your feelings with food. When a binge is about to happen, 
have an awareness. What am I feeling that I don't want to feel? That's what you have to deal with. And then finally, I'd like you to get involved in an OA community, an Overeaters Anonymous community. I know you're a very social being. I would love for you to pick a specific group where you can plug into the community where every Tuesday and Thursday at 4.30, they're expecting Scott. If I could just cut you short there, Tara. I I went to an OA meeting, okay, which I thought was going to be, you know, people that have weight to lose no. but in this oa meeting were bulimic people yeah. anorexic people yeah. that had you know the problem i can't relate and then when i went to my car because i was so furious when i turned on the radio who's on the radio karen carpenter a bulimic okay. uh, anorexic can I tell you who something? died from it but can i okay? tell you something the- and i can't if, if if i say i can't relate you see i'm getting angry then Cut it. Don't no, say another word. I'm going to say what I have to say because and, it's very important. And you said that to me. You said that to me in, in your because email. Because Overeaters Anonymous is for a mental state. The difference between a bulimic and someone who's obese is the obese person doesn't vomit their guts up every time they eat. But I just can't relate and it makes me angry because there are OA meetings that are just for people that have 100 pounds or more because there is more connection. I think that would be lovely for you because I think it would give you a place to voice your feelings, which is important. I think it would be a place for you to have a community because you're a very social person. And I think that what's missing in your life and what's driving a lot of your eating is a lack of community and a lack of human contact. I'll agree with that, that's part of it. And I think that OA would provide you automatically with a group of people who understand you, who you understand, and who where you feel like you're not gonna make a mistake. Do you understand? Right, yes. Yeah, all right. Sounds good. I think you can do this, and we're going to stay in touch, okay? Absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you. sweetie. Goodbye. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for having us today, all right? Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Tara. Okay, sweetie. Scott asked me to send him notes from our session to help him focus on the work he needs to do. As for me, I remain optimistic, but my history with Scott leaves me somewhat skeptical as to whether or not he'll follow through in the long term. We all have struggles, but for so many of us, it's easier to just push down our pain with an addiction. Only when you're willing to look at the parts of yourself that you don't like, do you have the hope of healing. Because until you do this, you're just gonna be running from yourself and nothing's ever gonna change.